Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here today, isn't it? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do have your Bibles open at Mark chapter 15. We're going there for one last time this week. And um, for the sermon this morning, we're focusing in on verses 42 to 47. Mark chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. Well, Jesus really died and his body was buried in a tomb. Those are the basic facts of these verses. Now, Mark 15, 42 to 47 are verses that we often read over fairly quickly. As a sermon, they're often preached together with chapter 16. We're quick to want to get to the resurrection. And it makes sense, doesn't it, because we go from death to life. And yet we are, I think, intended to pause here. We are intended to stop and consider Christ's physical death. We notice as we read that God's Word here is doing more than just stating the facts. In these verses, Mark is building up evidence to show us that Jesus was really and truly dead. He doesn't want us to be in any doubt that that death was real. So it's, a, it's a point, it's a truth of central importance to the gospel. Jesus truly died. In these verses, he's also telling us about a man whose life was transformed by seeing Jesus dead. Here's Joseph of Arimathea, up to now a timid follower of Jesus. And here he is looking on at Jesus hanging dead on the cross, and suddenly he becomes courageous, and he goes to claim Christ's body. For him, the death of Jesus has taken away fear. It's given him courage to act. And for us, if we've put our faith in Jesus, it should do the same. The death of Jesus takes away fear. It takes away the fear of death for us, and also the fear of others, the fear of man, if you like, the fear of speaking up for Christ. So this morning then, we're going to see the evidence that Mark gives us that Jesus truly died, and then we're going to see two implications of that death. Three headings. Firstly, Jesus truly died. Secondly, Jesus' death takes away the fear of death. And thirdly, Jesus' death takes away the fear of others. So we begin with this, Jesus truly died. In the late 19th century, people got very worried about the possibility of being buried alive. People feared they'd get ill, fall into some kind of coma or deep trance, and be pronounced dead, even though they weren't. They feared that they'd wake up later, and they'd been screwed into a coffin and buried under the ground. What a terrifying thought that must have been. And stories of people accidentally being buried alive became quite popular in the press and even in fiction. And in 1896, the London Society for the Prevention of Premature Burial. That's a tongue twister, isn't it? But that was established in 1896. People took this very seriously, I guess because they didn't have the medical advances that, that made it straightforward to see whether someone was dead. Some skeptics of the resurrection suggest that this is what happened to Jesus or something similar. He hadn't really died on the cross. He was simply unconscious after all the torture, and he revived in the tomb. But Mark won't let us believe that. The circumstances don't allow that. And Mark gives us compelling evidence that Jesus was really and truly dead. He does that by giving us a number of reliable witnesses. We start with Pontius Pilate. So here's Joseph of Arimathea in verse 43, and he goes to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. Pilate's startled. He's rather surprised that Jesus is already dead. It usually takes much longer to die by crucifixion. But as we saw a couple of weeks back, Jesus gave up his life when he finished his sin-bearing work. But this is Pilate. He's a brutal Roman governor. 
He's overseen plenty of crucifixions. He knows how things go. And this seems strange. And he's not simply going to accept Joseph's, Joseph's word that Jesus is dead. Jesus is this high-profile criminal. He's surprised. So he wants to make sure. He's not just going to let Jesus go. He's not. So what does he do? He sends for another witness. He sends for the centurion. Verse 44. This is the same one we saw two weeks ago, the one we just read about slightly earlier in the chapter, who, watching Jesus' death, responded in faith. Truly, this is the Son of God, he said, having seen Jesus die. Now, this centurion knows what a dead man looks like. He knows the difference between someone who's fainted under torture and someone who really is dead. He's seen many dead men. And besides, he can't afford to get it wrong, can he? You imagine what Pilate's response would be if he let him go when he was still alive. He's not going to do that. Jesus is truly dead. And then another witness, Joseph. Joseph comes with with others and they take Jesus' body down. This is the Jesus they love and care about and know about. They're not going to bury him if he's alive. So they're convinced too. So don't listen to theories about Jesus swooning on the cross and reviving later in the coolness of the tomb. Mark's gospel simply does not allow us to think that. Pilate needed certainty, and he knew what he was doing. The centurion was able to provide that certainty, and he knew what he was doing. Joseph saw it too. Jesus really died. We can't miss that from these verses. But there's more here, actually. Some more witnesses. But let's notice what we're told here about Jesus' burial. So Joseph took Jesus down from the cross. He wrapped him in a linen shroud, and he laid him in a tomb cut into rock. In the first century Judea, you um, you weren't buried in a a churchyard in a coffin. You were buried in a a cave-like tomb cut out of limestone rock. At least you were if you were rich enough or your family had enough money. Now, often these tombs would be quite large and contain a number of shelves in which multiple family members could be buried. About a thousand similar tombs have been found in the Jerusalem area, which verify that what Mark is saying here is is true. From the other gospel accounts, we know that this tomb was newly cut, it had never been used, and in fact it was Joseph's very own tomb. We should also remember as we look at it that Jesus' burial in this tomb was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah 53, verse 9. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he'd done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah tells us that the Messiah will die like a criminal, but be buried in a rich man's tomb. And that's exactly what happens. And we shouldn't be surprised by that by now. We've been noticing time and time again how Jesus' death And now his burial, fulfilled in great detail, both the big facts about the Messiah that were prophesied and the small details. But we're talking about evidence, aren't we? Are we sure about where Jesus was buried? That's an important question. It's not unheard of today for people to be buried in the wrong place. In February this year, in Southampton, two people were buried in the wrong place plots in the graveyard. If you'd uh, gone along with your spade and and dug in one of the plots they were supposed to be in, if you'd not been arrested first, then you would have dug down and found no body. Some people have tried to explain away the resurrection by suggesting that Jesus wasn't buried where people thought he was. When the disciples went to find him on Easter Sunday, they weren't at the right tomb, and therefore it was empty, and they said, oh, he's risen. Well, we'll come back to the resurrection next week, won't we? But we do need to understand that the evidence is clear. That didn't happen. How can we be sure? We have our final pair of witnesses. Look at verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Now, in the passage we read, we saw these two Marys in verse 40. As well, they stood with other women watching on as Jesus died on the cross. 
And now here they are, not only watching him die, but now they have watched him be taken down and laid in a tomb. And they have seen the tomb in which he has laid. You notice how Mark's Gospel is being very careful to tell us that. And next week, when we come into chapter 16 and verse 1, we'll see that these same two women went to the same tomb and saw that same Jesus gone because he had risen. Powerful, consistent, compelling evidence, isn't it? Jesus really died, and having died, was buried. He was laying dead in the tomb. Now, of course, it's essential to see that Jesus truly died, otherwise there's no resurrection. However, there's much more that we can say about the significance of Jesus' death. And we're going to say two things this morning. The first is, I suppose, a wider theological point. It's that Jesus' death takes away the fear of death for us, if we trust him. And the second one is directly from the passage, Jesus takes away the fear of others fear of speaking up for the kingdom of God. So we've seen then that Jesus really died, and now we're going to see that Jesus' death takes away the fear of death, the first implication here. In the Bible, death is never a natural, neutral thing. In contrast, in our society, in our secular world, people would say that death is natural. Death is part of the cycle of life. We live, we die, we're buried, we're replaced by the next generation, and so on and so on, until one day the the sun gets old and the world dies. We ought to embrace the cycle. But we don't embrace it, do we? We don't, we can't. Because death feels like the breaking of something that ought not to be broken. It feels like the ending of something that ought not to end. It brings fear. It brings terror, if we're honest. We realise that we can't beat it, we can't avoid it, but we desperately wish we could. Death looms over everything. Not as a natural event, not as a friend, not as just part of life, but as an enemy that takes away all that people care about. And in our world, the grave is fearful too, isn't it? It's a sad place. People stand at a graveside watching a coffin being lowered in. And when we're there, our hearts cry out, don't they? This ought not to be. This place of mourning and loss, it should not be. And when we appropriately go and pay our respects to a loved one, perhaps laying flowers on a grave, we cannot feel, we cannot help but feel, this should not be. All our instincts, you see, tell us that the death and the grave are not right, and we fear. That's what it is for our world, isn't it? Death and the grave. And that instinct is right, actually. When we come to the Bible, we find that is right, because death is not natural. It entered the world because Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. Death in the Bible is God's judgment on sin. That's what it is. Ezekiel 18, verse 10, the soul that sins shall die. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. That death, that judgment, includes physical death. Our bodies are dying and will die and be laid in the grave. This judgment is also spiritual death. We're born spiritually dead because of Adam's sin, because the human race has fallen and rebelled against God. We're born separated from God. And if we continue apart from God, rejecting him, disobeying him, When we die, we face the second death, eternal hell. That's terrifyingly what our rejection of God, our rebellion against him, truly deserves. It is terrible. It's dark. But it's also just. 
because God is a just God. And it is true. It's why we fear it so much. Death, both physical and spiritual, is God's judgment on our sin. But the wonder of the cross, the wonder of the cross is that Jesus comes to take the penalty of his people's sin. He comes to take that penalty. What is that penalty? It is death. Spiritual death and physical death. We thought a couple of weeks back about how Jesus deals with that spiritual death. Jesus bore it there in those three hours of darkness on Calvary when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that forsakenness, he bore the wrath of God. He was bearing the hell, the death for all his people, for all who trust him. He bore it, taking it away. But he had also to die our physical death too. He had to take the full penalty. He tasted death for everyone, says the writer to the Hebrews, everyone who trusts him. And because he did that, there is now no longer a penalty for those who trust in Christ. For them, the price has been paid Death in all its fullness has been born. And there's nothing for us to fear. When we trust in Jesus, the sting of death is taken away. The penalty of death has been paid in full. The power death had over us is broken. There's no fear of judgment now. We're no longer separated from God and never will be. We have eternal life in relationship with him. And though we will physically die, we need not be afraid of it. Power, its curse, its terror is taken away. And when a Christian thinks about the grave, it's the same. They need not fear it. We don't need to weep that one day our bodies will lie in the ground. For just as Jesus' human soul went straight to heaven when he died, so will ours. Just as his body lay in a tomb for a little while, awaiting the day of resurrection, so will ours. No, the tomb is not a place of fear for the Christian. Yes, the body may rot. Yes, it may be burned. Yes, it may even be lost. But when Christ returns, it will be made new. It will rise to be reunited with our souls, just as it was for Jesus. And so the grave is not a place of terror. It's a resting place for our body. Christian brothers and sisters here this morning, are you afraid of death? Don't fear it. Jesus has conquered it. And death brings you into the joy of heaven. It's not judgment for you. Don't fear your body lying in the ground in the grave. You follow Jesus into the grave. He went there first. He's been there. And you will follow Jesus out of it. Don't fear it. But if you're sat here this morning and you've not trusted in Christ, what about you? Are you afraid of death? I have to say, you are right to fear. Right to fear. Because you do, as things stand, face it as God's judgment. You're right to fear. Because after judgment of death comes eternal death, comes hell forever. But don't despair. Let that fear drive you to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Because the wonderful news is you can be liberated entirely from that fear. Jesus really died. And because he really died, he offers forgiveness to all who trust him with their lives, all who put their faith in him. And with that forgiveness comes freedom from the fear of death. Freedom from the judgment of hell. Eternal life in relationship with our loving God. Would you trust him this morning? Will you give yourself to him? Turn from your sin.
Trust in the Savior. Don't fear death anymore. Jesus truly died. And Jesus' death takes away the fear of death. But thirdly, Jesus' death takes away the fear of others. How does it do that? It brings us into God's kingdom. Well, Christians, this morning, do you ever despair about your lack of courage when it comes to speaking up about Jesus? Perhaps you're sometimes with family members or friends who aren't saved and you recognise that they're quite hostile to the gospel. And you get an opportunity to speak about Christ, but, but you can't summon up the boldness to say anything. Or maybe a discussion comes up at work or another organisation you're involved in, and you're anxious, really, about the consequences of being known as a Bible-believing Christian in that environment. And so you're just too timid, a bit scared to say anything, and you don't. Maybe somebody here would like to help out an open-air witness or some of the new outreach that we're hoping to do here in Shepshed. But if you're honest, you're, you're scared, you fear doing it. We know that's most of us sometimes, even most of the time. But don't despair. Joseph of Arimathea is a great help and encouragement for us. Joseph's a timid believer, made bold by Jesus' death, fearful before, but not fearful anymore. Who's Joseph? He's a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, the very same council that we saw some weeks back unjustly condemning Jesus and handing him over to Pilate to put him to death. Yet, he's a follower of Jesus too. Matthew's Gospel and John's Gospel both describe him as a disciple. But as John tells us, until now, he's kept that a secret because he's afraid of the Jews. He's a secret disciple. Could that perhaps be someone here, at least outside of church? Now, Joseph didn't support the decision to condemn Jesus, that's true. But he's too otherwise been too scared to say anything. He's afraid. And yet now, here's this timid disciple, as Jesus hangs on the cross, showing extraordinary courage. Verse 43, notice how this is described. Coming and taking courage, he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Why is it so courageous? Well, it's courageous because of how his fellow council members might respond. They hate Jesus. This is courageous because, well, the Romans didn't permit a respectable burial for crucified criminals, and Jesus was crucified for insurrection. Merely asking for his body could have been a a, a provocative act. Could have been in trouble with the Jewish Sanhedrin, he could have been in trouble with the Roman authorities, and yet, and yet, he goes boldly to Pilate. He nails his colours to the mast for all to see. He asks for the body. He takes that risk. He acts for God's kingdom. Jesus is dead, he might have said. Why bother? What's the point? It's over, isn't it? Might have said that. But that's not what he does. He chooses this moment to speak up, to act. He's a braver man than me, someone might say. But is he really? Because if this secret disciple can show courage, so can we. How? How can we do that, though? How can I do that? By looking at Jesus. We've already seen that Jesus' death takes away the fear of death. But we can say more than that from this passage. Look at verse 43. We're told there that Joseph was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. And I think it's helpful for us to pause and think about that. Because I think that Joseph understood that Jesus' death advanced the kingdom of God. Now, Joseph wouldn't have been unusual amongst Jews in those days. Many Jews would have expected the Messiah to come and establish a kingdom. The kingdom of God was coming. They all thought that. 
But there was much confusion about what that Messiah's kingdom was going to look like. Many people, I think, would have thought that he would perhaps come and defeat the Romans and reign from Jerusalem, and, and, and maybe global reach would spread out from there as he established his rule. Well, if that was the plan, then Jesus had failed, hadn't he? He was dead. But evidently, Joseph understood better than that. And we can understand far more clearly Jesus the Messiah did come to establish a kingdom, but not through military might. He had been establishing that kingdom all throughout his ministry, in fact. When he first began to preach in Galilee, he preached a message about the kingdom. It's all the way back in chapter 1 of Mark. The time is fulfilled, he says. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus preached a kingdom that is entered through repentance and faith. And he went on to teach that this kingdom would start small and it would grow. It was like a mustard seed at first. That's the picture he used, a little small mustard seed. But it would grow little by little over the years as people believed and were added to it. One day that little mustard seed would grow into a great tree. And you know that process is still going on today, isn't it? As all over the world, people are repenting and believing in Jesus and the church is growing, the kingdom is growing. That's the kingdom that Jesus taught. But that's not all. Jesus taught that the kingdom would only fully come when he returns and makes the world new. For whilst his kingdom is in this world, it's not of this world. Jesus looked forward just a few days earlier to a day when he would feast with his people in that coming kingdom, in the new heavens and earth. This kingdom is a kingdom that lasts forever. It's not like this current world that's condemned, that's passing away. The world we live in now is characterized by sin and death. But the kingdom of God, which we belong to, if we're Christians, in that kingdom, sin and death have already had their power broken by the cross of Christ. And one day when Christ returns, they will be fully taken away. No more sin, no more death. It's an eternal kingdom. It's going to last forever. But how can Jesus welcome sinners into that kingdom? Yes, through repentance and faith. But how can a holy God welcome sinners in? Jesus said, I have come to give my life as a ransom for many. That's how. He pays the price of entry. He dies to bear away our sin, our penalty. And that's why, even though he stood before Pilate and said, yes, I am a king, he willingly accepted the condemnation and went to the cross. He went to bear our death. He went to lie in our grave that we might enter into his eternal kingdom today. The kingdom of God. And Joseph must have understood at least some of that. He saw at least that Jesus' death was not failure but victory, that it wasn't the failure at the end of the kingdom, but it was the establishment of the kingdom. And we see clearly in God's word that Jesus died to bring us into that eternal, unbreakable, unshakable kingdom. So what does that mean? What did that mean for timid Joseph? And what does it mean for us when we're afraid to speak up and we find it hard? But two things. Firstly, if we're members of that kingdom through faith, we don't need to fear anything in this present age. Because this present age is passing away. We don't need to fear the mockery, the abuse, the mistreatment of the, uh, from people in this world that we may well receive. No one can do anything to us, really. Death holds no fears for us. So the worst anyone can do is kill us. 
And in this country right now, that's extremely unlikely. So what will we fear? We belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Jesus has died to bring us into that kingdom. And therefore, we need not fear anyone or anything. But secondly, we don't need to fear. Because living for Christ's kingdom, which we belong to, is worth the risk. Joseph understood that. He saw that it's worth giving everything to advance Christ's kingdom because this is the kingdom that really counts. And therefore, he stood up for Christ and did what he could do. And what he could do was a unique task, wasn't it? He could fulfill Scripture by providing a tomb for Jesus to be buried. He boldly served the kingdom of God and was privileged to play a unique part. So how can you and I be as bold as Joseph? We must come to the cross. We must come and see the Son of God hanging dead for us to bring us into his kingdom forever. And the more we see that, the more we're able to be bold. You can be bold because you've got nothing to fear in this world. You belong to the kingdom of God which cannot pass away. You can also be bold because you have something to do for the advancement of this kingdom and it's infinitely worth advancing it. People all around us are heading to death and hell. They fear the grave. You can tell some of them about Jesus. You can share the hope of the gospel with them, the hope of the kingdom. You can point them to the loving Saviour who takes away the fear of death. Will we pray then that God will show us what Jesus has achieved? Will we pray that as we see the cross, he will take away our fear and give us boldness to speak and act for him? Will we do that? Jesus truly died. His death takes away the fear of death for all who trust him. His death takes away the fear of others. So will we go boldly in his strength to proclaim the good news of Jesus crucified for us? To proclaim a kingdom which all may enter in through the Saviour? Will we do that? Let's pray that we are able. Amen.